All right, so as this video states, uh, in here we'll be calculating a crystallite size and doing some XRD manipulations from XRD data, obviously, using Python alone. There will be no need to use Origin or Origin Pro for these calculations. In fact, if this takes up and a lot of people and gains popularity, I'm pretty sure, confident that a lot of people will be using, uh, you know, Power XRD, uh, this Python package instead of Origin Pro. In my opinion, right, I consider it a little bit more involved, uh, the, the Origin Pro usage and application. So, and in, all in all, I also wanted to mention that this is open source, so you're more than welcome to also contribute to the project. Uh, you know, it's not without any errors, but we, we do our best. So, without further ado, oh, before also <laughs> starting, wanted to mention that this is actually a segue from a former project I work with, which is called XRD Pi, and also there was a video present for this, but uh, I didn't make it, didn't do such a great job, I, I believe, in terms of like user friendliness, and this is so much more easier to use. There's no even uh, need to read a manual or anything. Functions are pretty self-explanatory, and if you don't find them self-explanatory, I will be showing you these functions here. So without further ado, uh, I'll just start uh, the video. And so the, the thing you may need to do is not even like, you don't need to clone this repository or anything. To install this package, you just need to open a terminal or whatever else you use. And after you open the terminal, you just type pip install PowerXRD. And this will install a PowerXRD package to your Python package manager. So of course, I have already installed it, the latest version. Uh, if you need to, you've installed the former version and you want to upgrade, you just have to type the upgrade flag before PowerXRD and it will upgrade to the latest version. Okay, so after you've done that, then uh, the usage is, should should be pretty simple. You should just, uh, let's, let's start with just opening a Python window. Okay, let's actually uh, close this and clear and open it again. Okay, so if you want to use it, it's as easy as just importing. PowerXRD, and you can give it a nickname to, you know, so you don't have to type PowerXRD all the time. So in this case, I have the nickname or alias. I've used this XRD. And so with that, you can start like coding. Now, I will be uh, creating a script rather than, you know, running it through here. I think that it, uh, it's much easier really to explain things with that. So. Uh, for that, I will be using Visual Studio Code. If you haven't installed it, I'll provide a link below the video description so that you can do so. But so before, um, and there's also, of course, if you read at the read at the GitHub page, you'll see some usage examples on how to use it. Uh, we'll be not following this example. Uh, we'll be taking a different strategy. I, I will be actually cloning this whole uh, repository to my computer. And if you'd like, you can do the same. So by cloning, we just type you know, copy paste that, that code button, and then type git clone, git clone. I will actually clone it in my desktop. Yeah, I think that's wise. Okay, git clone, and we clone it. Yeah, so that should take a little bit of time. Oh, it didn't. <laughs> okay. So after you clone it, you can access it, and you can access the whole thing, the whole clone repository with Visual Studio Code by just typing code. PowerXRD, or just opening it on your own, if your Windows computer, right? I think you open it first, and then you declare the path and whatnot. But Linux uh, just makes things simpler, or you know, doing it through the terminal. Okay. So after you've uh, opened uh, your clone repository in XRD on Visual Studio Code, and we can do what we're going to do is we're going to also jump into it, change the directory to that clone repository. And we will be creating a file. I will be creating a file called examples.py. Okay, so you create it and then open it on Visual Studio Code on the same place. And so here will be, I will be showing you some of the some of the usage of PowerXRD, obviously. And so we start with um, what I mentioned before. Oh, why? Okay. So the first thing you may need to do is import PowerXRD, of course. And we'll give it an alias, XRD as alias, okay? We may also be using NumPy, the NumPy package. 
and alias np and we may also be doing some plotting so import the matplot library pyplot and alias plt okay so that's basically uh, what you will start with now uh, this power xrd package has two main classes the first class is called uh, xrx it's called data okay the data class takes the path of the file with the file name of course so in this case i've already have a file in this path right because the my examples uh, the examples python file is also in in that in the folder right where we have the examples py there's also a an xy file right and this is all fake xrd data i created it with just an algorithm which makes random picks at random locations and so because sample xy is on the same path as examples we can just call the file without you know specifying the path just sample dot sample one dot xy okay and so after doing that this class only has one method and the method for this class data class is called import file and what it does is basically it takes this data and converts it to two to an array with two columns okay and the two columns would be x and y so you can like though it will output those that's what you know this method does Now, the second method we have is called it's the more ample method uh, I believe it's called chart and what chart does is it basically takes the XY data that you've transformed here and it can then manipulate it with the methods from the class from the chart class which I will be showing you shortly okay so because chart you can see here on the under the description it takes two inputs right the inputs from chart from chart class are x and y which are actually the x and y that are processed from data import file method so what I'll do is you know just to show you some really uh, uh, common Python operations we'll just redefine this x y as data and then Python has this really interesting functionality it's really great functionality where you can just uh, dereference you know uh, the variable uh, to what it has inside so because data is actually two x and y variables we can do the reference them here because chart takes two inputs okay so the first uh, method which I will be showing you is called background subtraction but actually before that let's just uh, plot this how about that and the easy way to plot it right plot takes how many actually that's not gonna give me anything let me just uh, start with plotting oh, what did I do yeah let's comment this out and let's just plot the data as is without any transformation right and so of course you know because plot takes x and y as the uh, two main arguments and we can just reference them here and then we would have to type that plot show and then you'll see that if we run this Python examples file it will plot XRD data we have now it has a background right you can see that uh, a lot of these uh, XRD and I, I created it with an oscillating function so that you know you, we can I can show you that function background subtraction functionality and other things uh, so this is typically how a XRD spectra may look like it's just a baseline uh, an oscillating baseline which you know sometimes called a background so because of that uh, the first function I'll show you is how to subtract the, really this background okay so so now we've done that let's uh, uncomment this and you'll see right that the first method I want to explain is called background subtraction background subtraction uh, takes uh, an input an optional input which tolerance we'll leave it at one that's usually the default 
Um, and you may read more about it in the documentation, but it's just a way to really set up a threshold for what is the baseline and what is not. Okay. So, and of course you can see also from the documentation that the outputs are the transformed X and Y data, background subtracted X and Y data. So this, actually the inputs, the outputs, sorry, right, will also be X and Y. Okay. Now what we'll do, however, is uh, we, we can also dereference this, right? And let's actually go a little bit uh, further on that. And let's just set up this uh, this constructed uh, chart class as chart as a chart variable, right? Then uh, we can just set up the method backsub method to the chart variable, and that will basically give us the x and y data, right? So this would be equal to, let's say, it will still give us the output x, y outputs. We can make it more interesting and then we can add the background subtracted plot to the other plot and see a comp the comparison how it looks like. Now, as I mentioned, right, uh, Python has this really interesting dereferencing functionality, so we can just do that because, uh, you know, it's, the outputs are x and y, we can just comment this out. Right, that's, that was just for show. And now we can run again and see what we get. And so now you can see that there's, uh, you know, the the file, the XRD uh, chart as it was, and then background subtracted in orange. And so I think that that's pretty cool, right? We can go further, further steps and like add labels if you like, like let's say label, uh, default or access, maybe I call it access. And here, I guess, label. And we can say back sub for background subtracted. And then, of course, we have to define here the, the option that there's actually a legends to be read. We can run it again, and then we'll see that now we have some labels here. And so that would be like the first example. We'll just, uh, I'll just put all this stuff in a function to make it nicer, okay? So the function I'll be calling uh, back sub, okay, okay. So that was the first example. There's another example in the documentation in the GitHub page uh, where I believe what we do is we take we look at uh, an additional method, uh, which is really maybe for more advanced users. Actually, on the same test, where we are uh, finding an emission line in case we have a secondary source of radiation which comes up as noise. But I will not go over that. I think it's a little bit more advanced. You can read it or use it in your, you know, uh, if you'd like later on. So I'll be moving on to the, you know, to the really what this video the what is within the scope of this video which is calculating the crystallite size uh, using python of course through the usage of the share equation okay so just as uh, we have a back sub, back, background subtracting method here we also have a method to calculate share equation and the method is actually, so we'll actually need to use some of these as well. The method is called uh, SCHPeak. So it's written like this. And you can see that it takes, oops. So it takes uh, two inputs. The first input would be the, the range where the peak to be calculated is situated in, and sh an optional Boolean where we can just have the, you know, the method call to make a plot in itself. And so in that way, we do not have to really run this plot uh, function. It just does it built in. 
So that's actually a, quite a practical functionality. I figured that it's good if we want to overlay plots and things like that, so I, that's why I put it there. Okay. So for this example, we'll just run background subtraction again. Okay. So back sub. Let's just comment these out for the time being. And we will look at a peak we want to uh, really calculate the share, the, the crystallized size. So this one looks nice because it's like, I think it has the longest one. Uh, it is within from, let's say, 46 to 49. So that's the range which we'll be uh, doing the fit and calculating the, the share with. Okay, so 46, 49. So that is the number we need to type here. The first input would be the range where that peak is situated. Okay. Oh, of course. Okay, and the second one, as I mentioned, is just the Boolean which basically plots, does a plot on that, uh, on that specific peak. All right, so this will be our second example. And for our second example, let's say we're also gonna be writing a chart. Yeah, should we do that, should we? Yeah, that should be fine, okay. So we're going to be calling, again, the background subtraction method. And background subtraction takes two inputs. And so I'll be actually showing you, it's defaulted, background subtraction is defaulted to false. But I will be activating it so that it runs the plot internally. Okay. So after we do that, then we should just type plot show and it will give us a plot of the background subtracted uh, oops, <laughs> of the background subtracted data. Um, no, that wasn't it. Of the background subtracted data with uh, with the peak calculated peak as well. All right. So this is the second example. So we run it, and then you can see that it's been highlighted because that's what this plot for peak does when we set the boolean to true. So when we set that Boolean, it plots it in magenta. So it just highlights in magenta. What you see here in cyan is actually the Gaussian fit that is done to calculate uh, the crystallite size. Okay, so full width at half maximum. You know, the shared equation takes uh, some inputs and what that's one of those that's needed. And so we calculate here that for this, you can see in the on the right window that it does give pop out some outputs you can see at the end we have a share width of that of the output log is uh, the share width which is 20 point calculated to 20.9 nanometers as i mentioned this is just a uh, this whole uh, spectrum was just artificially generated it was just uh, it, this is actually not real xrd data so it doesn't represent any crystal or species or film whatsoever. Now you may ask me, well, and you did actually ask me uh, on a former video that what if we wanted to calculate, uh, just automatically calculate all the all the peaks and just you know throw out a log which gives us all the all the crystallite sizes. Right, if we wanted to do it in an automated way. And so I thought that, that was actually a really good question and it wasn't really that hard to implement. So there's also a function which does that. And the way that it does it is actually, I set it up so that it will do it recursively to just save uh, some of the runtime, make the runtime more efficient. So what it does is it finds the maximum here. Like let's say we are find the maximum and it's this one, which it is, right? Then after it finds the maximum, it takes the the limit on the right of that peak 
and then it finds the maximum between that limit to the end of the spect of the chart, right? It does that finds uh, and it does the same for the left hand side, right? So it takes the left limit and calculates the maximum between the left side, the leftmost side of the chart, to that left limit, and then it does it again recursively, right? So in this case, like we go to the right, it takes this one, then it searches to the, to the right, searches to the left, and it finds all the maxima in that way. And of course you may say, yeah, but I mean, it being a recursion, there will always be a maximum, right? Until it reaches zero. And even then, right, you need to set up a threshold limit. You, that's usually the case for recursive algorithms. So we did, and that uh, limit is actually the tolerance of a relative height to be stored to be stopped for a certain maximum. I set up, but you can set it up a, a, to a different value if you'd like. I set it up to 20, not 20%, what was it? Yeah, like when the height is less than 20% of the maximum height, then that's usually where it stops for in terms of peaks. Okay, and that I believe I, I'll show you how to set it up, set up that tolerance. So let's just move, start with the new, the last example, which is, you know, how to calculate, automatically calculate all these uh, <laughs> peaks, all right? So it is as simple. I know the, I made the dialogue a little bit uh, involved, not involved, but long, <laughs> but it is as simple as just calling this function chart, all, all peaks, that's it. And you can see that all peaks takes two arguments. The first one is a tuple of two values, which are the tolerances. And the second one is, uh, you know, an option to just plot each of those peaks in magenta. And of course, with a cyan uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian fits, right? So the first tolerance you see here for the first value on the tuple is just, as I mentioned, that minimum peak height to be calculated. And the second one is the, it's one which extends the length of the, the distance from the peak to the base. So in this case, I've set it up to 0.8 degrees as default. And I think that that gives me usually, that typically gives me good values, a good yeah, good result. So it's set it up as 0.8 as default. Uh, you can extend it if you'd like and set it up as an argument. And of course, the Boolean for show is set up to true by default. So that's all you need to really write. Okay, so we'll be uncommenting the single uh, peak method here to calculate all peaks. Okay, and then I'll show you. Then after we do that, we just replace that with the other. We run. Let's just clear the log here, and we run the code again. And now you'll see something interesting. You'll see that it did all that, right? So it calculated. If you want to close in, it takes. It automatically finds the maxima. It sets up a, a tolerance for the the width, which is predetermined. And it also sets up tolerance for the smallest peak which you can find because otherwise, as I mentioned, the recursion goes forever and it throws out an error. And so if you look at the log also, you'll see that it gives you the summary and all the calculations for all the peaks which are found. See the first, it actually goes from uh, the smallest angle to the largest angle. And you can see if I expand it, right? I, I, Set, it's set up to so that it can be copied and you know just uh, put a CSV file, and you can see the last column entry is the share with their slide size, and you know then the X Y data for the former two columns. Okay, and of course you you can like also zoom in, which I believe this is actually a, a in my opinion, it's a really good functionality for Python. This is not something. It does, it does not get as trivial if you're using Origin Pro, sorry, Origin developers, you know, just like closing in, getting higher. And so with that, I'd like to conclude the video. I hope uh, that you learned something new, you find this practical, 
and a lot of people may be using this tool in the future to simplify their lives. All right, so thank you. I believe that this should be it. Let me just go look at all the example, all the other examples. Oh, yeah. So the last example, of course, is just to uh, if you want to calculate a twenty point moving average. This is just an averaging methodology which takes the running mean of whichever number of points you want may want to take. And this is in case you have a very noisy plot. So I'll just show you that before we end the video and it's very easy. Just type chart, oops, chart, bit, chart, moving average. And, and so I'll set up the, the Boolean is set up to false. The, it, so it takes two inputs. The first input is the number of points you want to take for the moving average, the number of running points. And so we can set a, that up, the first one to 20, and we'll set up the Boolean to show the plot, to make the plot to true. We'll comment out all peaks. And this is, of course, doing a moving average of the background subtracted data, okay, because we have this function active. And so we can now rerun, save it, rerun. And it gives a, it gave us two, right? It gives us two plots. The background subtracted plot without the running moving average and the running moving average in orange. If we just want to uh, look at the running moving average by itself, we can just set up this boolean to show plot show boolean to false for the background subtracted uh, method, and then we run the function again, and you'll only see the running average. And of course, with the running average, because it's taking 20 points, and all of these uh, are way lower than the than the peaks, it will decrease the y-axis values, and so that's expected. If you want to go with a higher running higher number of running mean points. We can go to 50, we can try that, and you'll see a, a you know, I mean a more averaged, right, uh, chart. Now, of course, there's a, also a lack of a decreased uh, resolution in this case, so that's always a, a compromise that you may need to take when you're running this type of averaging functions. It's best to leave it, well, actually, I leave it up to you on how to use it if you would like, if you find it practical or useful. And with that, I'd like to con conclude the video. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be uh, leaving the, these relevant links under the video description. I hope you found it practical and you start using uh, this package instead of uh, other packages which you may find more difficult, of course. All right.